Um, maybe I should back up a little bit. I don't even know where to go. I'm just going to ramble here on this. But my original idea about eight months ago was to make a 64 on a chip. Um, and I was going to use a 6502 core behavioral model with the 6502 and then do the VIC and the SID and put it all into a single chip and make a portable Commodore 64 just for myself. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. yeah, but much more complicated, 100,000 gates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the Commodore PLA probably had you know, 300 gates or something like that. It's pretty small. Um, well, anyway, I started working on the video part of it, and I was kind of excited that I got some video out of it. And I was going to the, um, What's the website stuff. The Commodore uh, Chicago Expo, so I wanted to show people. Oh, neat! I've got this. 24-bit video card hooked up to a um, Commodore 64. Now I had all kinds of problems, and it quit working the night before. And anyway, I flew out there anyway, and I got a new chip. And this, you know, you know, last moment, plugged it in, reprogrammed all the logic into it, and kind of showed off this kind of half demo of you know, scrambled colors all over the screen. I was trying to convince everyone, yeah, this is really going to be a Commodore 64 <laughs> screen someday. <laughs> And, uh, and, and that caused some problems because uh, people were kind of skeptical that it was going to ever happen. And then everyone started flaming me on the um, CBM, Compsys CBM, and places like that, that I was getting people's hopes up and stuff that had never happened. Uh, so anyway, I just kind of went in secret about the whole thing. And people kept asking if I would do a video card. So I was like, sure, I'll, it'll be a video card. It'll be an enhanced video card, and that's all I would tell people. And, uh, you know, I'd leak a little bit out. Well, I got some, you know, the sprites working, I've got this working. And um, meanwhile, I was developing all the pieces to make an entire Commodore 64 on a chip still. And then I, I kept looking at it, like, well, if I just add you know, 16 megs of memory, that'd be kind of cool. And, you know, how about if I add Zorro slots to it so I can. Uh, <laughs> just keep adding, just, just keep adding on. <laughs> um, so I just kept adding things, and uh, I, uh, I don't know, maybe a month and a half ago, I finally had enough of these small little pieces, which I had been developing on a Commodore 64 motherboard, and I was pulling the chips out one by one and replacing them with ribbon cables. So I'd have this big wad of cables running over to the CIA chip, and I'd replace all the signals that were supposed to be there. Yes, it fired up, and it works, and I can access the disk drive, and then I'd replace the other CIA, and all right, the keyboard works, and um, finally got the um, VIC chip to work all the way. Um, I, don't know, I spent the last two or three months, I haven't had an NTSC monitor hooked to any Commodore. It's all been on a VGA monitor, which is really cool. Well, that's definitely an improvement right there. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever a month and a half ago I said. I is that how it's going to end up? Is the uh, VGA monitor compatible? Yeah. VGA only. Outstanding. A lot of people want me to do NTSC, but it's not worth, uh, I don't think it's worth well, it. Right. A, lot of, a lot of people want NTSC. The European side wants PAL, so you can't satisfy both ends. Yeah. But a neat thing with the um, multi-sync monitors we have, I can make the Commodore One, which is, um, Robert actually kind of came up with the name and I like it, so <laughs> I went ahead and using it. Um, I can change the timing of the video so that the Commodore One can run PAL or NTSC, so we can run the European demos or they can run ours. Yeah, doesn't matter where we're at. Because, well, it's going to be software driven. But, that's kind of another little section. I wish my my stuff's all ripped apart now. I couldn't bring it with me because I'm building the MFM decoder for the floppy disk drive. Um, it's going to have a 1.44 floppy PC style floppy interface on it. <laughs> um, and also an IDE IDE on it. Maybe you've got to dump the rest of those. We've been hoarding. I think we have a few existing brand new, you know, old style floppy disks left in the country. We bought them all up from MEI before they discontinued them. The what? The, 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 the 
So yeah, you're standing oh. flopping. So we've been hoarding these things, and so I don't know if we're actually the people. Are doing. Them. So we better dump them. We no, them I, don't, I don't know if anyone will ever want to buy this thing. We'll see. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you can actually. It's going to be quite a demand. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. The, the development's definitely been in modules. Um, I've been trying to make everything work 100%, then I move on to the next section, move on to the next section. So. Um, as far as it emulating a 64, I'd say it's pretty darn close to 100%, I would say now, except for the SID chip. I'm still having all kinds of problems with SID, and I have faith that I'll get around that somehow. Um, <laughs> the, um, the first board that I have planned is going to be an ATX form factor. It'll fit inside of a standard PC um, tower. You can get for $20 almost anywhere, or $30, so pretty inexpensive uh, PC stuff. If a person had, is somebody with a PC going to be able to add this to a PC? Um, it's a full motherboard. Oh, yeah, it's yes, got so Zorro. It it's not quite Zorro. Um, it's the same, uh, same kind of idea as Zorro. The pins are different. Um, it has a config chain, so you can plug in multiple Commodore cartridges. Um, it's a long slot. You um, put in all the cartridges aligned to one edge, and then the computer, when it turns it on, it shuts them all up except for the first slot. And then the operating system can go ahead and wake each of the cards up and place them into memory, different banks of memory, or place it anywhere in memory that you want. So if you have an REU or something you plugged in there, you can place that in bank two, you know, the second 64K or the third, or you can place it. You know, different places. So this will be basically a standalone chain. Oh yeah, entirely a standalone. Okay, and, chain. and so you you wouldn't be able to incorporate it into another into another platform. Uh, I don't understand. Well, the reason the reason I'm asking that is because the thing that's always amused me for for years is that uh, on the PC side they've always wanted to emulate the 64. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've done it via software. On the right. And uh, but they're always you know. It's gotten actually quite good now, but for quite a few years it was pretty, pretty sad. But they would go to great extents to do it, and then somebody would pop up and say, you know, well, why don't you just get a 64 if you can't run this? Mm -hmm. You know, which was really a sensible solution, since mm -hmm. you could get one for about $10. But there seems to be this, this thing that they, you, they want the 64 in their like, box. Like a PCI card that plugs yeah, into it? right. I didn't know whether the, uh, whether this, Technology would adapt itself so somebody. It's possible. All these modules that I have, like the big module and the SID module and the CIH, you could go ahead and put those on a PCI card. I don't have any plans to do that right now. But you have to write an interface. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. The yeah. big reason I wouldn't want to do it. Plus, PCI is a total nightmare to deal with. So I don't. Yeah. Well, the address seems on that idea of something to drive it When I was playing with programs on the C64. When you jump to an address, you jump to an address. You didn't jump to some nebulous thing. Plus, plus or minus an offset like that. Uh oh, you're not going to like some of the things I'm doing on the Commodore one then. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am putting some, um, uh, some different memory management in there where you can trick the, um, the computer into thinking that you have several Commodore 64 you know, native memory sections. That's what you would call it. And shadow registers that each program will write to. And you'll be able to task switch between them or have multiple processors um, writing to these shadow registers. And uh, I've already uh, made a, a way to do hardware um, screen dragging, like on the Amiga. Have you seen that where you can just grab the top screen oh, yeah. and drag it down? Yeah. Um, so you'll be able to have multiple 64 programs running. That sounds a little like a moment task in 64. Yeah. <laughs> especially with now that, especially I mean, now that, it's like asking, especially yeah. now that they've released like JOS out in alpha stage. Yeah, well this will be able to multitask existing um, Commodore programs without an OS on it. Interesting. Um, and also it's going to work, um, well if it works the way I hope it does. <laughs> it's, um, there's also windows between these 
um, these tasks that are running. You can either have one processor jump from task to task to task, and what we're doing is we're yanking um, the, uh, uh, the stack, halting the processor, having it dump everything in the stack, moving that away, and then bringing in a new stack and a new program. You can have it do it that way. Plus, I, or um, you can have multiple CPUs um, writing to these shadow registers, so you can have a CPU per task if you want. And I'm also putting windows between each of the CPUs so that each CPU, if you write a program to take advantage of these memory windows, you can go ahead and um, have them have communication between each of the CPUs. You can set one CPU to um, decode a JPEG and another CPU to play music for you and another mm -hmm. CPU to run GeoWorks or something. Uh, so, you're uh, okay. so you're talking about like multiprocessor instead of yeah. multitasking off of one, one, one CPU. Yeah, I think that's right now it's the only way we're going to get um, speeds you know, equivalent to PC is to um, add these $5 processors to the, the board instead of trying to make um, a really fast 6502. Um, eight months ago when I gave my first speech at the um, Louisville Expo, I was talking about the possibilities of you know, having full custom chips made and, and uh, you know, the, on the web they've shown that you can go about 166 megahertz on a 6502, but there's no way I'd be able to come up with the money to make a 166 megahertz CPU. You were working with a Commodore, a former Commodore engineer. What was that? So I heard somewhere that, you, that was somebody of uh, the old Commodore organization. Yeah, Bill Hurd's been helping me with Sprite Logic on the uh, on the BIC. I was having some trouble making that work right. Um, he oh, was he was the engineer that uh, or the head engineer on the 128 project, mm -hmm. and. Uh, He's responsible for a lot of the reasons the 128 is so compatible. So he was kind of like, you know, Jerry, you know, you should kind of watch for this and, and this. And it's been very helpful talking to him about that. Chris Haney, I guess, was also, but he started out on 128. Yeah, I, I, I cornered Dave Haney at the Amiga <laughs> show and uh, picked his brain quite a bit, what, too. What did Dave Haney say about your project? He thought it was really neat. A lot. Well, you can basically take as many 6502s as you want. And Chain, chain drive. Up to 256. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there is a limit. And then okay. we just have to expand you know, another set of registers for beyond 256. <laughs> really awesome cooling system. <laughs> yeah, a Honda generator to run the whole thing. Well, actually, I was talking to someone on, online and said, Oh, I'd like a 64. Um, the Commodore 64, but 64 processors with 64 megs of memory or oh, something. Yeah. And uh, I did a calculation of what it might cost. It was like $1,200 worth of CPUs and <laughs> control logic for it. I'm like, well, you know. What about DOS? I mean, because you essentially have an intelligent drive with the uh, with oh. 41 Okay, yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. That's the... That's always seems, it seems to also been a hurdle in emulation because so many of the software was written to that drive. Yeah, that's, um, I think I found a way around that so that I've got, I've worked on the IDE, I've got a, um, a buffer that's 256 bytes long where you can pull in memory off the drive 256 bytes wide and you can, you can view that from, mem or from uh, main memory if you like. But um, what I'm doing is I have a coprocessor, which is a stripped down um, 6502 that's on the graphics bus. It's not residing on the, um, the main system bus. Actually, I should back up so maybe you understand some architecture of this, how it's different than the regular 64. The, the regular 64, you know, the VIC chip, um, it, it steals cycles from the CPU when it needs to access and fetch data to display on the screen. So it's actually slowing the CPU down. And uh, that's a big reason that the uh, Commodore didn't, you know, even on the 128 uh, with the VIC chip enabled, you can only go 1.02 megahertz or something like that. Is because the, um, the VIC needed to know exactly how fast the CPU was and how to steal cycles away from it. Um, what I've done is I've stripped the, 
the video bus and the main system bus, and I'm, I put them on their own buses, so they're running asynchronous to each other, except for they do a total mirror copy between the two. So the video bus still can see what's happening on the main system bus. And, uh, but you can run the CPU on this side at 1 megahertz, 4 megahertz, 1.2, 1,000, whatever you want. And it's still going to appear the same to the big chip on the, the graphics bus side. But I had some free bandwidth on the graphics bus side, so I went ahead and put a coprocessor like the Amiga has. I'm calling it the copper, but it actually has more instructions than the copper does. Um, so it's... Hey, you were getting along real well with the old Commodore. <laughs> <laughs> what? I said, you were getting real well with the original Commodore, because they had all those people upstairs that were doing all this. They never ever released any of it, but they were doing all this great stuff. <laughs> Well, no, no her, her, her inspiration, of course, is also the C65, the, the, well, which, yeah. of which only, you know, less than 200 uh, prototypes were ever made. But it was still limited to a single um, memory bus or a system bus on it. So it was um, really tied to the um, big chip again. I think they managed to squeeze 4 megahertz out of it. Yeah. But um, currently I'm working on a Commodore 65 mode, which as far as I can tell from the documents that leaked out and from what people have discovered about the Commodore 65, I'm trying to um, make a mode where you can switch into that and all the registers line up for that and it has all the same video modes. The only thing it's going to lack is the CPU and the Commodore 65 had some banking instructions on it that the um, 65816 doesn't have. Um, I have a 64 mode, and I'm looking at 128 since I, I have all the video modes for the VDC, but the memory manager in the 128 is a little weird. Yeah, so it's, I don't know if I can make it compatible with everything and still have the memory manager on the, the 128 mode. We'll have to see. Um, oh, where I was at the disk drives. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Now that we know that the um, graphics bus and the main system bus are separate, and I have a processor sitting on the graphics bus that's separate from the main processor, um, what I'm going to do is I've opened up the CIA registers where the IEC serial port is. I've opened those up so they're visible within the graphics bus also. I'm going to take the coprocessor, which can also see the floppy drive MFM decoder section and the IDE um, you know, sector buffer, and what it's going to do is there's going to be a, a file system layer, which on uh, there's a Commodore 1 mailing group. I, I recommended that maybe we should use FAT32, oh. and everyone exploded. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that FAT32 is what they use on PCs. Yeah, Ooh, people hated that. They hated that. <laughs> But okay, there's going to be some kind of file system. Maybe we'll have to do Amiga <laughs> OS or something, or Amiga, Amiga file system, so everyone will be happy. Yeah. Um, and then there's going to be a 1541 layer, which um, the first thing it's going to do is probably load a D64 file in, like it, which we use on the emulators. And then the 1541 layer is going to be there to decode the D64. Um, file system and then yeah it, it appears to be easy I haven't written any of the um, code to do that yet but, um, and then I'm going to trick the IEC re or the CI registers to think that they have an external source that's causing them to receive serial data well kind of I mean I'm going to I'm going to sniff the IEC bus and I'm going to do it kind of like the um, CMD Hard drive, you know, hey, it's swap eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Poor CMD. A uh, couple of, you can, you know, one comment on the DOS. In Oregon, some of these you should probably be young even know. Have you ever heard of a guy named Mike J. Henry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. fast hack. Yes. Mike J. Henry, of course, is from your, from your backyard, and we just a long, long time ago, I had some ties with him. Uh, probably, I can't think of anyone in the world who knew more about the 1541 operating system mm. than him. Is he still around? Well, <laughs> I need help. He's, you know, he's not, he's not that, he, he was doing, that he was in high school. 
when he was writing that stuff. He's still, so he's still, he's still fairly young, young and uh, he was the mm. actually basement boy software. Yeah. You can run in fact I've got some old Oregon magazines was actually <laughs> literally that was basement it was his parents' house. Oh so interesting. He probably anybody if you got connections in in Commodore community in uh, Oregon mm -hmm. or anything, he would probably oh, give sure. her down. I haven't heard from you know, anything from that guy in a long time. I remember, you know, back in my hacking days and freaking and doing all that stuff, trying to get all this pirated software. You know, he was the guy. You no, know, but, he, but he was, of course, he wrote a lot of protection schemes, too. And he did that basically because he understood the fishing for <laughs> operating system so well. In fact, he would write the protection system and then write the system to break it. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was a good deal. I think he made a lot of money. Yeah, that's what we call the college that way. But uh, that, that's just one person, maybe because he's north or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and also, you might be able to answer this. Last I heard, after the ESCOM deal, there was a Danish group or somebody who acquired the rights to Commodore 64. Mm. <clears throat> they were going to produce the Commodore 64. Uh, that. Right. 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 Us? Here it is. Uh, last time I heard, it was Tulip Computers owned uh, the rights to the Commodore Commodore name, but uh, supposedly all 8-bit you know 8-bit uh, plans have been destroyed by them, so they just have the naming only, and they're using it we for their Commodore, PCs. I mean, yeah, that's what I figured when you were talking about this. I mean. Even if you knew everybody who ever worked at Commodore, they'd long since probably lost every, all the memory, everything, you know, for the construction of the 64. But yeah, I think I pretty much covered that now, just but, the behavioral model. Yeah, uh, however, they, they, there was this project, and he's got it, he asked you where they were going to produce. You, you've seen it. Barton, uh, Ray Barton. I have no idea. I, I just threw it in as an oddity. You know what's ironic about this? When this came out, uh, their website, early 1999, mm -hmm. I think so. That's about when that issue is, yeah. Yeah. I emailed them and said that I wanted to help them on this and that I would offer my services for free. And they wrote me back and said, no, we don't need your, your help at all. Is, I'm assuming that this is, is vaporware. I mean, you don't know anything that this ever went anywhere. You're no, I the mean... Um, <laughs> it's not a totally shock. What kind of space was this the first time you knew about this? I know about the, the, the splitting of Commodore and Amiga. I mean, that's ages ago. Oh, yeah. Um, Everybody was so focused on the Amiga that nobody paid any attention. I did hear... That's why they I heard a great that they were going to bring the 64 back and start selling it in the Asian countries, in, you know, in the poor countries. Mm -hmm. Apparently, still, but it never actually got <coughs> off the ground. Um, at one stage, I mean, I can only speak for Europe, but at one stage, Commodore actually did come back because uh, it was Commodore speakers. There's actually Commodore PCs. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. I saw them in the shops. This was the irony of the whole thing. If the Commodore, the way I read it, well, did Escom, a lot yeah. to help pave the way for the yeah. PC in Europe. I mean, Escom actually bought the Commodore name. Yeah, but they had to have Amiga with it. Right. But the trouble is, it cost them so much money to buy Amiga and Commodore. He actually bankrupted them. Well, plus they. Um, Got a bad deal that did Pentium 60s, yes. <laughs> and then also Pentium 90s yeah. came out and couldn't dump all I think, the that, I think maybe Intel and Microsoft and some of the people on this side of the pile. I mean, it's only, <laughs> yeah. it's only till now that Amiga is actually coming up with the goods. Right. Everyone has actually said, we'll do this with the Amiga, we'll do that with the Amiga. Even Gateway 2000, that they actually uh, released a prototype, oh God, what was it called? Um, um, it was actually a box, yeah, that was it. But they showed it off at the last show, it was yeah, solid they, oak or something, and they painted it. That it looked with, really with nice. With a monitor on top, and yeah. they kept it in a glass case. Yeah, I can't even remember what it was oh, called now. Oh, yes, it was yes. Actually yeah. at, so, it was actually at well. No, that was the walker. That was the S-Com walker. S-Com walker. The one the gateway did was beautiful. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it looked like a big box, it looked like 4,000. A big box Amiga with a monitor on top. You couldn't touch it, it was actually in a glass case. Last time I saw it is the um, World of Amiga show. And, uh, you know, and everyone's going, yeah. God, this is the new Amiga. World of Amiga. Um, I think I saw pictures and I always assumed it was just a rendering. I'm sure it's a Amiga <laughs> MC or something like that. You know, and everybody actually. 
Yeah, I'm sure it's something like that. That's always been yeah, the danger. Everyone's actually going around the, the swinging. Yeah. Always, well, well, that's I have videotape of it if you want to know. Well, well the danger is that you've got you all these people who are so good at rendering stuff. I mean, yeah. you can create all this convincing, uh, you know, pictures out of nothing. Yeah, no. But it's not until um, Fleecy Moss and Bill McEwen actually uh, bought the company. Right. They actually back the mouth up, you know, put the money where the mouth is. Mm -hmm. And they're actually coming up because the Amiga one is actually now on sale. I could have bought it last month. Mm. Uh, the one? Yeah, it's actually on sale. Oh, really? Yeah. You mean the Amiga one? Released, the Amiga <laughs> he's, one. He's telling this to Amiga Incorporated yesterday. We visited Amiga yeah, Incorporated yesterday know. in Snoqualmie. He told them, and they didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, and, that doesn't um, <laughs> Yeah, because they, they were asking me for information. <laughs> and I thought, well, you guys are producing the stuff. This is the thing. But they're not producing the hardware. This Everyone asks the same question. Is Amiga producing the hardware? No, no. they're not. No. They're only producing the software. That's all they're interested in. And they're producing software for the Amiga one, which comes out in the second week in August. And they're producing an Amiga emulator. I think they're going to, the Amiga I think OS. They, they want to show it here at the uh, Sacramento show. Yeah, but they're pushing it more in Europe. I mean, what happens is, there, there's a show in, in um, Surrey, which is near where I live, it's near the south coast. Um, I had a choice to go to the show or come into America, and I thought, well, I'd, I'm coming to America anyway, but I'd like to go to the show. And I, I went there on a shoe string. I actually went there on a shoe string, and I'm glad I did that. I went there, I went there with 20 quid, but I ended up spending about 70. <laughs> So the, the credit card took a bit of a bit of a dent there, but um, I come away all right. And they actually, on that day, because I went there, wanted to see the Amiga one, I knew it was going to be there. They had a prototype. Uh, I've been corrected on this, <laughs> and that, because Bob's been bending my all about it. What they actually had there, what they actually had there is a tap with the Amiga one in it. Um, and it was all set up. And it's, everything is PC peripherals. Uh -huh. um, I'm not very good at explaining it, but I'll do my best. Every, it's all designed so you can use PC hardware, like mm -hmm. graphics cards, uh, USB ports, um, serial, everything. And it's beautifully set up. So they had a big tower there with the side taken off. And everybody's going around and all the cameras are flashing. And they said, right, this is the Amiga One. They said, the only thing that's not on it is the interface to connect the 1200. But they said, we have been, we've had f official permission to release it from today. And everyone said, come on, you know, can we have the board? They said, well, no, we're not selling the board. We are selling it as a complete package. We have five with us. So the first five people that come up with the wad, mm -hmm. They can have one. They can, and that, I saw no some people. Yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. saw some people. <laughs> I actually saw somebody buy one. He actually bought one there and So what you're buying is you're buying a tower. Uh, it's called a Z4 tower with an A1200 board, an Amiga one, um, a 48 speed CD ROM, the floppy drive, a 170 meg hard drive fitted with 3.1. And you're actually and the PC keyboard, and they're throwing them out. So what they're doing is they're taking the Amiga, Amiga Magic Pack and putting everything in there, and they're just adding the, the Amiga One. The show price was two hundred and seventy-five pounds, and I've been told what was it four hundred and fifty dollars? Four hundred and fifty dollars. I mean that's really good because if you're buying, if you're buying the Amiga, uh, the, the twelve hundred brand new, it was a hundred pounds in the shops. But if, what they do, every time they have a show, there was discounted. Uh, minimum of five pound, up to silly money. I mean, I actually got a scan double, a Flickr, Flickr fixer, for 50 quid, and they normally go for 100. So that's sort of price, that's why I spent 70 instead of 20. I just went over 20 thinking, oh, well, I'll cut the games, but when I saw the Flickr fixers at half price, you yeah, know, I thought, can't argue. But their, their attitude is because everyone's made an effort to come to the show, we can make an effort to discount it, but they said we can only bring five. And they said, oh great, so we can use the Amiga 1. They said, no, you can't use the Amiga 1. <laughs> it's, they said it's working, it's, it is actually working. You can't use it because it will be designed to run on OS 4. Yeah, that's what I was but, going to say. Yeah, yeah, it's designed to run on OS 4. So what you're doing is you're buying the tower, 
and use in the 1200 side of it. But as soon as OS 4 comes out, it is here. Yeah, you load it on the hard drive and then you, then you just go. So it is really designed for someone who wants to be first in the queue and then when they start taking their pre-orders for, the, for your OS 4 and as soon as it comes through the post, you load it straight on the hard drive and away you go. Of course, they have some credibility because like OS 3.9 which I got just appeared like blindsided everybody. It was well, it, it, in fact, it annoyed me because it was a significant improvement. I, you know? I mean, I specialize in the plus four. Yeah. I've got the biggest collection of plus four in the world. That's why I gave you that magazine. It's yeah. just a terrible pan. Love it. Love it. No. I'll have a look at it later. I mean, everyone's. I read a Commodore magazine that said the plus four was a total joke. Oh. Every, everyone says that. And so then I say, then I out. say, fine, fine. Just look at my collection, because everyone seems to think there's about 50 tapes on the plus four, and that's all it is. Yeah, I mean, in my collection alone, I've got over 1,200 discs alone. More than 10,000 me... programs. Yeah, you know, you get so many. I've got Geos on the plus four, and everyone says Geos on the plus four. They said it hasn't been invented. It has. It was invented in Germany for so the German market only. And then the Italians got hold of it, and they converted it into English, because English is the international language. But the plus four Geos only runs on the 1551, mm. and because it's so, you need a 1551. So I had yeah, so 1551. <laughs> so well, when I when I first got the plus four, um, I was I literally you know I, I got it. I wasn't even interested in the computer. So my, my wife turned around and says, "Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a computer for the kids?" I said, yeah, all right, fair enough. <laughs> so right. we went down the shops and we saw the Amiga and we saw the 64 and I thought, no, I'm not paying that. And the mate of mine turned around and he said, well, I've got a plus four, you can have it for 20 quid. Or 20 pounds, you know. Sorry, if, if I'm talking fast or if no one understands, just please say. What year was that, just out of curiosity? Uh, right. About 94? Uh, yeah, probably maybe even okay. earlier than that, 93, 94. So I had nothing, I actually bought the plus four when they released it in Europe, they released the Plus 4 with 10 games. I always call them the standard 10. And that was like um, Fire Ants, um, I can't remember what the name of them. But anyway, they released the 10 games. Took it home, kids weren't interested, and I'm sitting there playing in front of the telly, and I thought, oh, I quite like this. And I suddenly thought, well, would it be nice to get a few more games. <laughs> so I bought the local paper, went through the S, and it just happened that somebody was selling 50 games for 50 quid. And I thought, well, that's fair enough, pound a game. So I went down Brighton, which is 15 mile away, um, bought them there and then, loaded them in, and I got hooked. And then I suddenly thought, because I was, then I started getting into Commodore, and I'm thinking, oh, I'll have a plus four, I'll have a 64, I'll have a little 20. Uh, I'll have one, two, eight, you know, whatever else, else is in there. So I started looking into the plus four. And I thought, right, well, it runs on OS 3.5. And then suddenly I saw these, these magazines, well, OS 3.5 runs on plus four, it runs on the C16, and it runs on the 116. And then, 116. Ah. Now that was a machine. <laughs> that was a machine that was, again, only been released in Germany. <laughs> it was, Ooh, it, so, and I've got one. I'm proud to say, I actually got one. Um, it, is, it looks exactly the same as the Plus 4, but it's smaller. And it has a, a rubber keyboard. Mm -hmm. But some of the keys actually stick. And um, in Europe, they released a machine called the Spectrum. Yes, I yeah. yeah, no, and it's Specky. Well, we used to nickname it the Specky. Yeah. So we, could, we said, oh, it's a Plus 4 with a Specky keyboard. And that, but it was only released in Germany. Nobody ever wanted it. And it was only released for 16K. And it was the plus, like the C16 was released for 16K with no software on it whatsoever. And then they released the plus four. But it never took off. It, it took off reasonably well in England, but everyone was disappointed. It took off really well in Germany. And if you're into computers, you've got to go to Germany. See, so Germany, the thing we always heard, because I got involved, I got one of the first 10 64s that came to this area when they were still soccer chips and stuff. The thing is we always heard all through 64 and all through the Amiga days was, yeah, they're not really big here in the States, but in Europe everybody's got Commodore, everybody's got Amiga. I mean, yeah. you hardly find a PC there. Yeah. 
Then I started talking to people, that's why I asked a year, in the 90s over in Europe. And I went over there in 1980, uh, 80, I think, or 89. And I was, then the Commodore was somewhat present, but there was still a lot of PC stuff at that point. And I would talk to people and they said, God, you are so lucky to live in the States where they have all of this really high-end stuff with Commodore and Amiga and all the serious stuff and where people actually use this and this is just a game machine like over here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I began thinking, you know, everybody's got this concept that somewhere else in the world this is big, you know, what, you know. Yeah, you say that, I mean, I've had I don't know if there's, I've, I've, had, can, I've had Americans. Is that true? <laughs> no, 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 I've had Americans write to me and say, God, I wish I wish I lived in Europe because you've got everything out there. I mean, well, I found the biggest place is Germany. If Germany goes into sunny, they go into it big. 